For a case of a headache, using our mnemonic old cards will note the onset, or when did it start. For the location, we want to know what side of the head your headache is on. For duration, has your headache been constant since it started, or is it more intermittent? If that's the case, we like to note the frequency, or how long does your typical headache last, and how many headaches are you having per day or per week. Next, we can note the progression. Do your headaches appear to be occurring more frequently or more severely? Or if there has been no progression, we'll also be sure to state that in our patient note to show that we asked. To help characterize your headache, we'd like some descriptors. Is it dull or sharp? We'll also reintroduce our stick figure as we'll see below to help guide some of our questions. Aggravating and alleviating factors, radiation, treatments tried, and severity on a scale of 1 to 10. And again, if there are no aggravating or alleviating factors or radiation, we'll also be sure to state that in our patient note to show that we asked. Starting from the head and working our way down, we want to be able to rule out trauma or a loss of consciousness concerning for a subarachnoid hemorrhage or stress as seen in the tension headaches. In the eye, we'll ask about vision changes as can be seen in a giant cell or temporal arthritis, a hypertensive encephalopathy, or pseudotumor cerebri or photophobia, a sensitivity to light, as we'll see with migraines, or tearing, as we'll see in the cluster headaches. In the ear, has there been any phonophobia or sensitivity to sound, also as we'll see with the migraine headaches, or for the nose, any runny nose or congestion, as in the cluster headaches. In the mouth, we'll ask about any nausea, and in particular, vomiting, and we know by now vomiting is a bodily fluid, so we'll use our mnemonic A, B, and C to write down for our patient note the amount, if there's any blood, and the color, bilious or non-bilious. We can see vomiting in a migraine, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or any brain lesion due to the increase of CSF. Also here, a speech difficulty, as we'll see with a migraine with hemiplegia. And in the neck, if there's been any stiffness concerning for a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a meningitis. And finally, the extremities, if there's been any neural findings, such as numbness or tingling or a motor weakness, as we'll see with a migraine with hemiplegia or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. For all cases, let's order a CBC, serum electrolytes, ESR, CRP, and a CT of the head. In a tension headache, we'll have a headache that's bilateral, and we can let the T in tension help remind us of the bilateral band-like sensation. The duration will be greater than 30 minutes, typically 4 to 6 hours, and it will be aggravated by stress, a decrease of sleep, or the menstruation, and it will be alleviated by sleep. In a migraine headache, we'll have headache, now unilateral, a duration of 4 to 72 hours, and it can be preceded by an aura or warning sign, such as a smell, classically maybe a burnt rubber, or vision changes. We could also have the photophobia or phonophobia, sensitivity to light or sound, and nausea and vomiting, and we'll use A, B, and C for the vomitus, and classically a female patient. In a special case of migraine, migraine with hemiplegia, we'll also have the neural findings of sensory loss, such as numbness, tingling, or a motor weakness. In a cluster headache, we'll have a headache that's unilateral, retroorbital, a duration of 15 to 30 minutes, tearing or rhinorrhea, and we'll use A, B, and C, and it will be aggravated at night. Classically, the patient can tell us it's starting shortly after falling asleep, high yield. Also, we'll have here a male patient. In viral sinusitis, we'll have a headache with a sinus pressure or facial pain and a rhinorrhea or a cough, typical upper respiratory signs. And for both, we could ask A, B, and C for our patient note, and also possibly a fever. And what helps us differentiate a bacterial from a viral sinusitis could be the above symptoms plus the time course if it's greater than 10 days or the phenomenon of double sickening or worsening after an initial improvement. And we'll add to our workup a CT of the sinus. In a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we'll have a headache that's sudden. Classically, it's the worst headache of my life. Stiff neck, confusion, the neural findings, numbness, tingling, or motor weakness. We'll also have here nausea and in particular vomiting and we'll use A, B, and C, and a history of trauma or hypertension, smoking, alcohol, or aneurysms. We'll add an LP with CSF analysis and a PT and PTT as we do for any case that involves blood or bleeding. In meningitis, we'll have a headache, a stiff neck, petechial rash, decreased oral intake, nausea, vomiting, and we'll use A, B, and C, a fever, and a history of a camper or a military recruit in the special tests of a positive Brudzinski or positive Kernings, and we'll add an LP with CSF analysis and blood cultures. In giant cell arthritis or temporal arthritis, we'll have headache, 
in the temporal area. It can be aggravated by chewing, jaw claudication, also vision loss, an age 70 to 80 years old, and a history of polymyalgia rheumatica. Our patient may not give us this nice differential, so they can instead describe pain or stiffness in the shoulders or the hips in the review of symptoms. And we'll add here a temporal artery biopsy. In trigeminal neuralgia, we'll see electric stabbing pain in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve, classically the cheek area. It will be unilateral and the duration of seconds to minutes, and it can be aggravated by touching, shaving, brushing, chewing, talking, in the cold air, or even smiling, and we'll order an MRI of the brain. In hypertensive encephalopathy, we'll see a headache, confusion, vision changes, We'll have here again nausea and vomiting, and we'll use A, B, and C. And this differential can be given to us in the vital signs if we see a blood pressure greater typically than 180 or 120, or in our history if we have a hypertensive that's not compliant with their medicine. And we'll add a dilated fundus exam. In pseudotumor cerebri, we'll see a headache with blurred vision, also nausea and vomiting, and use A, B, and C. And classically, an obese female patient with a history of oral contraceptives. We'll add a urine HCG with LP and CSF analysis. And finally, in an intracranial mass, we'll have a headache aggravated when lying down or in the morning and alleviated when standing, and the classic findings for a cancer of weight loss, decrease in appetite, or night sweats. We could also have here the vomiting, and we'll use A, B, and C. And also, our patient will tend to be older, greater than 50 years old, and with a positive family history, and we'll add an MRI of the brain. He has headache right now. You can see the room is well lit, the light is on. And this patient has headache in the emergency room. So I'm taking a history. So Mr. How, how long have you had this headache? Doctor, you keep asking me these questions, but my head is just killing me. I can't even focus or answer, think I'm, of anything. I'm so sorry. I'm going to do this real quick, okay, and help you. But in the meantime, would you like this light off or oh, dim the little bit? That would be very helpful, thank you. All right, I'm going to dim the light for you a little bit, okay? Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to go through this as quick as I can and uh, get you the relief you need, okay? Yeah. All right. So that's how to deal with a patient who has headache and who is not really being cooperative with you. We'll start our neuro exam with hand sanitizer, and we want to ask our SP if we have permission to examine them. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to start with the hint exam, and we're going to use it as a guide to help us out. So for the head, we could comment that it's normal cephalic, atraumatic. For a case of vision loss or headache or hypertension, we want to do a little bit more complete uh, eye exam. So to do this, we'll get out our fundoscope here, and we're going to use the same eye as a patient's eye. So we're going to use my right eye and his right eye. And so I'll ask him to keep looking straight ahead, and we could verbalize that there's no fundoscopic lesions, and he has no AV nicking or hemorrhages. We'll move on to the oral pharynx. So we'll use a tongue depressor here. The key thing to do is you don't want to add too much pressure for the SP, so just very lightly you can press down, ask them to please stick out your tongue. Okay, and we'll comment that we don't see any uh, lesions. We'll move on to lymphadenopathy, so we're gonna go ahead and inspect his cervical lymphadenopathy. So we'll start over here. Next, we're gonna go ahead and do submandibular, submental. Okay, we're gonna do preauricular and postauricular. Do occipital, and we wanna do supraclavicular. So please shrug your shoulders. Okay, good. And then we can now transition to the cranial nerve exam. For cranial nerves, uh, cranial nerves, uh, one, we don't really assess cranial nerves, so we could kind of use that as a hint or as a placeholder to test their alertness and their awareness. So we could ask them, uh, what is their name? Kalichi. And where are we right now? The clinic. Okay, good. And what time of day is it right now? Afternoon. Good. So now we could see, we could verbalize that they were alert and oriented times three. Okay, now we could transition to the rest of the cranial nerve. So for cranial nerve two, ask them to look straight ahead, and we're just going to check their pupillary constrict the response, and then we're going to do the same thing on the other side. We're going to do the same thing here, and then we're going to do it on the other side. Good. Now we could verbalize that they were pearl, that pupils were equal and reactive. We're going to transition to cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6. So please, you'll instruct them to please follow your fingers with their eyes, keeping their head straight, and you could see that he's able to follow. Okay. Trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, and we're going to assess this with sensation. So please uh, close your eyes and let me know if this is equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So for cranial nerve seven, we're going to go ahead and ask him to please smile, puff out your cheeks. Okay, don't let me pop them. Close your eyes real tight, don't let me open. Cranial nerve eight, and we'll ask him to 
please close your eyes and let us know what side you hear this? Left. Okay. You hear this louder on your left? Yeah. Okay, good. So that would be a concern now if he has hearing loss on his right hand side. So continue with cranial nerves 9 and 10. So you could ask him to say, ah, please. Uh. And we would try to stick out your tongue and we would visualize that we could see a non-deviated uvula. And while he's out here, we could also ask him to do to move his tongue left to right and we could say that his hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12 is intact. And now we will finish up with the cranial nerve 11. So please shrug your shoulders, okay? So they're equal. And look that way and resist me, okay? And look this way and resist my movement, good. We're gonna continue with MSRP. So for motor strength, please make a muscle for me. Okay, and resist me. So five out of five, full reflection, and extend five out of five on extension, great. Now we're gonna do sensation to light touch. So please close your eyes and let me know if you feel this equally on both sides. Yes, I do. Okay, now we're gonna do a pinprick. So please let me know if you feel this Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing on your right. His reflexes, so we're going to look at his biceps reflex. We'll place our thumb on his biceps tendon. And this would, uh, his normal reflex would produce a 2 plus response, okay? And if we were concerned for a case of B12 or hyperreflexia, he would have a 3 plus response. Okay, you would see that. Uh, now we could uh, assess his radial pulses as well. So we could do one at a time at a time if you're more comfortable and we'll verbalize that it's a two plus pulse regular rate and rhythm. After we completed the MSRP for his upper extremity we can now move down to his lower extremity and we could do the same thing. For motor strength on the lower extremities could you please kick out? Okay good so that's five out of five. Now can you please kick in? Good five out of five. Now we'll go into sensation so please close your eyes and let me know if you feel this equally on both sides. Yes I do. Okay great. And now we're gonna go into pinprick. So this is a pinprick. I'm gonna start on your left side and please let me know if you feel this all the way down. Yes, I feel it. Okay, and now I'm gonna go on to your right side. So please let me know if you feel this. Yes, I do. We could instruct him to relax and we'll do a patellar reflex. So a normal patellar reflex would be like two plus. And then if we were concerned like hyperreflexia or B12, uh, we would get a hyperreflexic response. So just relax and you'd see something like this. And we can continue to demonstrate with the tap on his Achilles tendon. So we'd start right here, and we would we would get a normal reflex. And if this was a case of B12, and we were concerned about hyperreflexia, he would give us a dramatic uh, response. Okay, and you feel that. We could also test while we're down here a Babinski. So we could start on the bottom of the sole and go into the big toe. And note, if he had a positive Abinsky, his toes would curl up. Okay, and then while we're down here also, we would want to assess his pulses. So his posterior tibial pulse would be behind his uh, medial malleoli. We could confirm that it's a two plus pulse regular rate and rhythm. Okay, now that we've finished with the lower extremity, we'll go ahead and sanitize again. And we'll ask our SP if they could please stand up and walk straight. back. We'll go ahead and listen to the heart sound. The mnemonic we want to use is apartment M225A. That stands for the aortic, so we'll check that aortic first in the second intercostal space on the right. And then we're going to go to the pulmonic side. Tricuspid. And then we're going to go to the mitral, and if this was a female patient, a tip you could use their rest up. Okay, we can make a comment that we heard audible S1, S2, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Start off listening, we'll switch it over to the bell and we'll use that to listen above the clavicle. And the instructions you want to give is when you feel my stethoscope, please breathe in and breathe out. <laughs> 